I'm coming to you from the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, no, no, no. Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh no, no, no. nations. No, no, no. Can I ask everybody, please, to mute themselves? Because we're getting feedback from you. And and today's presentation, um, pleased to have some new pe people, with Barbara Bernhardt and Joe Steinberg, uh, Stemberger will be talking about Slovenia, uh, which they say is a land of resilience. So I'm going to hand the uh, meeting over to them um, and they can introduce your, themselves first and then go on with the presentation. Just right. wait a minute, just wait, please. Who's asking us to wait? Barbara, are you okay? Yeah, no, we didn't. It wasn't us. But... Somebody else talked, so I don't know. Okay, so Barbara, <laughs> why don't you uh, get started and let okay. us introduce yourselves and Joe, please. Okay, uh, I'm Barbara Bernhardt, and I was say? with the School of Audiology and Speech Sciences at UBC in the Speech Language Pathology section. And I'm Joe Stenberger. I was in the Department of Linguistics. Okay. Um, and uh, we're going to, to, to give a slightly uh, unusual presentation about Slovenia. Um, I should say that uh, when I'm in Slovenia, I go by Joze Stenberger. My uh, father was born there and um, he came over as a baby uh, with my grandparents. Um, and um, I grew up uh, saying Slovenia, but in our local community here in Vancouver, we say Slovenia, so I'm going to go with that. Um, the, uh, the talk is not going to be based on a specific um, a trip that we've taken, because when we've gone together, we've uh, gone there for work. We had projects going on at the University of Ljubljana and the University of Marburg. And we visited my relatives and everything else just kind of was secondary or tertiary to all of that. Um, I went myself at age 18 and took uh, something like 130 pictures, but I didn't own a camera at the time. So my parents said when I suggested that I was going to buy one, suggested that they would loan me a camera. And they did. And then uh, when I got home, I discovered that none of my film was exposed. And they said, oh, yeah, it was acting up. That's why we were willing to, you know, trust you with it. Um, great. Um, anyway, so we're, we're going to be using pictures we've taken much more recently than that. Um, okay, how do we forward this part? Okay. Um, here's a map of, uh, of Slovenia. And uh, you can see kind of the whole thing in in outline here. I don't know, can you see my cursor when it goes around or not? Yep. Yes, but um, please so, don't move it too quickly. Okay, so it's this this dark line right here is, and uh, um, the, um, if you look, it, it shaped, the map of the country shaped kind of like a chicken or a rooster with the head up here in the northeast and uh, the feet down here in the southwest and the tail um, in the northwest. I put a star everywhere that we're going to be visiting. Uh, we kind of put together three little areas that you could travel in. And uh, probably most of the slides are going to emphasize more the southwest here, which is um, the area that my family is from. This little star right here um, is... Um, Iluska Bistrica, uh, which is a county, and in particular the town of Jablonca, and that's uh, where my family is from. Now, when you um, go to Slovenia, the question is, how do you get there? And if you're coming from here, you'd probably fly in and you've got a choice. You can go to Ljubljana, uh, which is probably where we've usually flown into. Um, if you're coming from somewhere else, like on a train, you might discover that Ljubljana is labeled as Laibach. That's what you see in Hungary. Um, originally, the city was known as Emona uh, when it was founded by the Romans. Um, you don't see that very much anymore. Uh, the other option for flying in that we know of is to go into Klagenfurt, which is in southern um, um, Austria. 
Um, but uh, in Slovenia, that's known as Solovitz. Uh, and you can drive, get a car and drive down from there, including going up over the mountain peak, over the mountain pass and down and visiting a, 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 a restaurant um, that's been in business for 500 years. I don't know. We did that during a snowstorm, so it was kind of fun. Um, you can come in from elsewhere in Europe on a train. Uh, you can come in on bus from some places and you can drive. And we'll uh, come back to that. When you're actually in Slovenia, um, if you're just going to be doing stuff in the major cities, and we'll come back to what we mean by major city, uh, you can get between them on trains and buses. And um, the trains, uh, they, they're express trains called intercity trains, um, and they're also milk runs. Um, and uh, the buses are a bit less efficient. But if you're going most places, uh, you pretty much need a car. Um, there is a lot of biking in the country and a lot of bike routes uh, in the country, but most of them presuppose that you're going to load your car onto a conveyance and drive there. Your bike onto it. Your bike onto a conveyance and drive there and then pull them off. Uh, in a lot of places, the uh, country roads are narrow and the traffic is at high speed and, um, you know, there are, there are dangers associated with that. Um, in fact, I had a cousin who was killed on her own country road as she was walking along it, so um, can happen. All right, um, and I'll hand it over to Barbara now. Okay, so... Slovenia is, in, in, in its location, it's kind of at the crossroads of southeastern and western Europe. Um, it's not a big place in terms of size. It's smaller than the neighboring countries, and it's smaller than Vancouver Island. And it only takes three hours to get through the country from the Hungarian border to the Italian border. Um, also, it's about the same size as Vancouver in terms of inhabitants or the lower mainland, at least. So we're not talking about um, a lot of people or a lot of space. So if you do want to visit that just one place, uh, it's, you know, it's certainly accessible and, and doable, as Joe says, if you have a car. Having been at the crossroads of Europe um, is, is interesting. We'll get back to that in a moment. So the yellow things are what we're going to show pictures of today. Um, Slovenia has a lot of mountains. It has a lot of valleys because it has valleys by the mountains. Um, it's quite well known for its karst and limestone caves. There's 9,000 caves, but only 20 available for tourists. The most well known are Postojna Yama and Škogjanska Yama, which has a UNESCO designation. There are quite a few rivers, even though it's not a very big country, and some of them go underground because of the caves, and a couple of well-known lakes, Bohin and Blet. And it's got a very small coastline with the Adriatic, and that has varied depending on which um, war this has ended up after. Um, and uh, it's fairly rural, and the towns that are there, or cities if you want to call it that, um, are small, and there's lots and lots of villages. And the capital is about the same size as Regina um, in Saskatchewan here, and has some very nice architecture by Joze Plechnik, who has architecture elsewhere around the world, specifically in Europe. And Argentina. Oh, in Argentina, okay. And um, when I first went there, that was in 2002, that was quite a bit after Joe first went there in 1973. 73. Um, and uh, the first thing I thought of when I got to Ljubljana um, was that it reminded me of Europe when I went there in 1967, that it had just a, a sense of old Europe, and I found that very appealing. And just a very brief look, as I'm not a historian, but it's so, because it's at the crossroads, there are so many different people who have um, come through to stay or to conquer from way back and from the Neanderthals all the way up to um, Napoleon and then into the 20th century conflicts. And it became its own country in, in uh, 1991 and sort of calm, calmly withdrawing from Yugoslavia, which was interesting. Uh, but they had been planning that for a while, so which I think is how they got out from under. And um, it, it's 
really clear in the language and in the culture, all the various influences from the peoples that have been there. Interesting, the Slovenians aren't really mentioned until the 16th century. So it took a while for that to have a, um, an identity. Um, it being language people, we're interested in the language and what most of our goals in research were related to language there. Um, it's a South Slavic language similar to Croatian and it's got a phenomenal number of dialects for a country that has two million people. If you can imagine 40 dialects of English in Vancouver um, that were not all mutually intelligible, then you can get a sense of what it's like there. So if you live at the Hungarian end of Slovenia, you might not be able to understand the person at the Italian end of Slovenia, um, because even though the words might look the same in the printed page, they sound so very different. And how did that come to be? Well, one of, it, well, one of the reasons is the language is in contact with all these different people wandering through over centuries. Uh, the fact that it's a, a mountainous valley kind of terrain, so the villages were separated by geography. And then the conflicts um, changing the schooling. So whoever was in charge would say what language that you had to learn in the school. Um, and I it just find it quite amazing that Slovenian as a language survived all these centuries and in spite of all of the uh, different peoples that had gone through. And one, one thing that was kind of interesting, there's a, a monument to Napoleon in one of the squares, the square to the French Revolution in Ljubljana. Um, and uh, Napoleon did not require that people spoke French as their only language. Uh, he allowed the Slovenian language to continue, which is interesting. Um, and today, like your question is, I don't speak the Slavic language. How am I going to get by there if I go? And the, the fact is young people there are now speak English. If you speak some German, the elder, older people speak German. And if you speak one of those other languages like Italian or Russian, you have a good chance of being understood. But it's interesting because the older people don't really speak English, you know, which was a bit of a challenge for me because I didn't know the language when we went to the village. So I've been, I'm working on getting Slovenian to a point where I can have a conversation. So what do you do when you go there? A lot of outdoor things. If you're into outdoors, it's a great place to go. It, it's a lot like British Columbia in some ways. So hiking, mountaineering, skiing, if you like ski jumping, I'm not quite into that. Um, cycling is a, is a great idea, except if you don't like narrow roads, it's not a great idea. There's a lot of uh, sports in the water uh, and there's farm stays and horseback riding. And if you are preferring indoor things, there are some good museums, but there's also a lot of performances um, and a lot of home craft things to be paying attention to. And we're going to show a little bit of some of that today. One thing that gets funny, if you turn on the TV, like at any day of the week, you can watch people playing accordion and singing the same kind of music. And that gets actually a little bit annoying, but you know, it's okay. I like accordion. It's not that I don't. Um, and there's also a very strong interest in classical music. And more recently, sort of pop rock, and they're very fond of sending things to Eurovision if they can get in. So this year, their group was called Joker Out, and their song was Carpe Diem, and they came 21st, and that was a big thing. So what about the Slovenians at home? Because that's sort of our great experience that we got to uh, learn what it was like to live as a Slovenian. And they're very, very into home crafts. So it was quite remarkable. So making lace, making wine, making brandy, making tea, butchering their own pigs and, and horses. And all, yes, and horses, I have to say. Yes, we ate, no, I don't eat meat, but Joey had to eat horse meat one time. Um, making their own prosciutto and keeping bees and doing lots of farming and gardening. And uh, they're very into hearty food and drink and whatever you would want to not eat because you thought maybe that wasn't really good for you. They would say, no, no, Zaza that's it's good for your stomach. And, you know, you have to, eat, you know, have brandy three times a day. And I'm like, I'm not quite clear on that. Anyway, there's a list of some of the foods that... Um, that they really like to eat. And the thing is being vegetarian, how do you manage there? There are some vegetarian restaurants few and far between, but if you ask for a vegetarian meal in the traditional restaurant there, 
you will be not appreciated. <laughs> so very much a meat based um, in the in the main restaurants. And uh, the other uh, funny thing for us in in the, in the family was uh, there was a great fondness for schnapps, which they call schnappets, um, and the rakia. And one time, as we were about to be leaving in the car to go somewhere else, and Joe was having his morning coffee, they asked him if he'd like some schnappets with that. And it was like, he, they were really surprised that he didn't want to have schnapps for breakfast because that's good for his adult And so, but anyway, that was just a little bit of the culture. If you are into unusual meats, uh, there's a restaurant in um, Ljubljana called Rtechikon, which means the red horse. And that tells you what it serves as its primary focus. So I think you're going to move on to the next part, and that's going to be this area We're here. We're actually going to start showing. Yeah. Well, you're going to start in um, Yablanza. Yablanza. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll just start this one because the horse, although Joe's on it at this point and being led by his, his cousin's husband, Yvonne, um, that horse surprised me as we drove up and parked our car by the village houses where the relatives lived. And we got out of the car. The first thing I saw was a horse stick its head out the window. So this window that you see here, that's where the horse lived. The people are living here and the horse was living there. And uh, that was the first time I'd, I'd experienced animals living in the same house if they weren't dogs or cats or, you know, fish or birds. Um, but it was very common in 2002 to still have your animals, your farm animals, living in the same building on the other side of the wall. And when they joined the EU in 2004, that was no longer allowed. Um, and so they had to build a barn for the horse and he had to live across the street. Yeah, so when I was first there in 1973, I took pictures of people going out with their horse and uh, cutting the hay with a scythe and loading it manually onto uh, um, wagons and so on. But as I said, none of those pictures uh, came out. Um, at the time, they there were nobody had phones. There were only four phones in the in uh, the main town, um, which were each one was at the post office and the others in three uh, th the three major employers. Really modernized um, since then, so you know, uh, but it it was a bit behind, perhaps about fifty years ago. Um, so this is a view back up. Um, behind the houses there. Uh, it's, it's a narrow valley and uh, um, with, with a mountainside coming right at the back of the property. And you can see um, that they keep animals. You can see the, uh, the slopes. Um, there are some which are, have a little bit of terracing because uh, my great grandparents had a winery, uh, which is no longer there. Um, down in the main center of town, there's an old, I think they call it a castle, but it's more of a, a mansion, um, which uh, was destroyed in uh, earthquakes, which happened a lot in the country. And um, so just uh, you know, ruined things like that. There are other things like that. Uh, there's a church up, at the, up on the hillside, which uh, um, has frescoes and a whole bunch of things in it. It's very nice and it's got a little forest growing up on the floor of it. Uh, roof collapsed, uh, I guess, at the end of World War II and they didn't have any money to fix it. So no longer an active church. There's also a, an old castle from the 1300s up on the hillside. Again, it's just complete ruins. It was used by the partisans to some extent during World War II. Um, it's a bit of an orchard and uh, and bees. They have a, a bee house in the back, and this is something they're all very proud of. They um, they have panels on the beehives which are painted in a very kind of what style that's often called naive art, I think, um, and um, quite commonly seen in many places. Um, this is uh, the local uh, tool for. Uh, distilling and we spent an evening uh, as they were doing cherry making cherries making it into rakia sitting around until all hours of the evening talking and eating 
eating bread and cheese and um, um, sausage, all things that a, a gluten sensitive, <laughs> non-dairy vegetarian like Barbara had a difficult time with. Uh, this is where they butchered the pig. Um, and we don't have a picture of the blood, I'm sorry. Or the, or the partial heads and stuff. Yeah. Um, speaking of, it's not just pigs. Um, there are wild boars on the mountain. And um, my relatives, I, I guess they killed an adult and got the piglets. And uh, they raised the piglets. We saw them when they weren't really all that old. But they're the scariest farm animal I've ever seen in my life. And this uh, picture on the right is from um, um, a walk I had. That's a, a boar skull. And uh, I don't know whether or not it was left um, and the tree grew up underneath it or whether somebody wedged it onto a tree and then this is a couple years later. Uh, but uh, definitely the wild boars are something you think about when you go up there. Um, some of my uh, cousins have bought uh, this place, uh, which is a bit north of Iriskabistrisa, still in the same valley, the valley of the Reka River. And Reka just means river, so it's the river river, the Reka Reka. Um, they, uh, they bought this. It's, uh, it's a hunting lodge that went to, with a castle nearby, and uh, they were doing sheep for a while um, before it turned out not to be economically feasible. Um, and here are their sheep, and here you can see the castle up on the top. Throughout Slovenia, there are these castles which were built on uh, hilltops uh, beginning in the 1200s when the Turks were uh, threatening. Um, and I don't, as far as I know, the Turks never made it into this valley, but they built one uh, to be ready, just to, ensure, to be sure. And here we have... They had horses, and then I can't actually make that out without my glasses. That's the boar. Oh, that's the boar? Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, they had, my, my cousins had tried to, to uh, get into agritourism, which was a big, big thing that people were talking about. Then it turns out there maybe isn't as, uh, as big a market for that. Um, but there are still places in Slovenia. If you look up agritourism in Slovenia, um, places where you can go and, and rent a room and stay for a week or two and actually get out and uh, tend the animals and do farm chores and stuff in so far as you want to do so. Okay. They had a, uh, in, in their castle, they had a, in their, their mansion, <laughs> their ancient, their house, whatever, uh, they had a black kitchen and it's black because there was no place for the smoke to get out. Um, but it was uh, it was kind of cool, and just you can just see they put a boche court um, with it because of course everyone plays that. Um, that shows a little feast that we had, and um, the uh, there's a local folk group called Volk Folk. It's their fa the family's name is Volk, which is uh, German for wolf. No, is it no no? It's Slovenian for wolf, um, and um, and uh, they play oh. Barbara actually has a... Oops. <laughs> yeah, I don't actually know. Are you sharing your mute sound so they could hear that as well? I don't know. We could hear it. Oh, excellent. Yes. And so they're a very traditional um, band, actually, um, and uh, have done a lot of research on uh, on folk music and costumes in the area and so on. Oh, and there's the, bo the boche uh, court. And I actually held my own as we played. They're much more experienced than I am. They tend to throw in a somewhat different way. Um, I guess I loft more and they keep it more low, but it uh, worked out pretty well. And so if you wanted to, to stay out in the countryside or whatever, it's probably, I mean, we've had great times there and probably, oops, ah, no, <laughs> yeah, there we go. So that's just uh, every time we go, we wind up going there to, to spend time with, with the family. Um, but there are a bunch of other things that you can do that are of a more traditional um, tourist way. 
And uh, the first thing we're going to do is, is go over to the coast. This area here is called Primorska, which means by the sea. Um, all 50, all 46.6 kilometers of it. <laughs> um, and uh, what we're gonna do is, um, I'll hand it over to Barbara. We're gonna go up here and go around and then head south and actually exit Slovenia briefly. Then we're gonna come back up and uh, go through here and then take a little trip up there and then take a little trip here and then we'll be at the end of what we're doing. So, uh, Barbara, I'll let you take it. So just a little bit north of Alerska Bistrica is a, a, a very interesting castle that's been built into the, the wall of a hill, basically, where there are a lot of caves. And that was probably around the 12th century. And it's the only preserved castle of this type in Europe. That makes it a bit interesting. I haven't personally been in it. I believe Joe has. Um, and so there was a robber baron who um, hid out in there. And because there were the castle led into the caves, you could just keep running around in the caves and people couldn't find you. But eventually one of the servants betrayed him. And the story was something like uh, Game of Thrones, apparently, which I've never watched. Um, he was killed by sitting on sitting on the loo. There you go. I should say that that's one of my favorite names of a place. Uh, the castle is called Predjamski Grat, which means the castle in front of the cave. And the cave is called Podgrajska Yama, which is the cave under the castle. So it's like there isn't really any name there at all. It's just kind of like twists around. So a little bit north and west of that, you can go to Lipica and uh, where the Lipicaner horses um, are bred and raised. Um, and that, that's pretty nice. You can get a really good look at the horses. And what was interesting to me, and I didn't know that, maybe you do, that when they're born, they're actually black horses um, and, or dark brown, and they become light and white horses as they're getting older. Maybe that's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, and if from there you can look down on Trieste or Turst, um, and that's one of the interesting things about the World Wars. It was whether Trieste was part of Italy or whether it was part of Slovenia. At one time, there were more people living in Turst uh, that were Slovenian speaking than there were living in Ljubljana. So it was a very big Slovenian settlement. And when I visited Trieste um, back in the 19, early 1990s, there was a big question of whether Slovenian was going to be allowed in the schools. So it was still controversy going on in the um, lands just outside of the borders of Slovenia, where there are a lot of Slovenian speakers, whether they're allowed to speak their language and use it. Well, the EU brought in new regulations that required indigenous languages that are spoken there and have been spoken for centuries to be, to get at least some kind of support from the government. Right, so that's from 1993 when I was there until 2004, things probably changed then. Um, and then going south from Trieste down, down to um, the coast, there's a really interesting tiny place called Rastolia, and they have a church there, and it's near Koper, and it's inside a wall, as you can see by the picture, and it has a phenomenal fresco in there, which is the Danse Macabre which was built um, and put in there about 1490, but hadn't been discovered till 1949 because it had been, I guess, plastered over or something and they were cleaning it. And then they went, wait a minute, there's something under here and this phenomenal fresco. It's really worth a side trip. I think there are only two or three of them in, in Europe that are, that are this well preserved. And uh, the point of it is that uh, we all die at some point. So they show people in all walks of life um, yeah, dancing with uh, skeletons. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so the Adriatic is a very small coastline there, um, but two very lovely little towns are Piran, and uh, that one has a strong influence of Italian, and Porto Roge, which is just a walk down the road. So those are really worth going to, and there's some nice sunsets there. And Porto Roge feels more Austrian. Um, the, um, the, the Habsburg, uh, well, the, the Austrian government, um, had a place there nearby for the, uh, for the emperor and to, to stay when he came down and the architecture is much more Austrian. And then Peron is much more Italian. 
and you're close to Croatia then, so you might as well go across the border. Uh, and we were able to go to a couple of places at different times. And one of them that we really enjoyed was Pula, which has a very large amphitheater, which you can see here, um, built in 81 by the Emperor Vespasian, who also founded the Colosseum. And it's the only Roman arena that with four preserved towers and not for use for gladiators anymore, but um, people like Elton John and Leonard Cohen apparently have done concerts in there. And it was really a lovely um, visit to that. And these are some of the new inhabitants at the amphitheater, lizards and snails. And lots of other Roman ruins in Pula, very worthwhile visiting that particular town. So I think we're heading over to the mountains. Well, um, well we're going to head north. I think actually the first stop would be Postoina. Ah, yeah. right. Yeah, so on the, we were talking about karst and all, you know, the limestone caves and so on in Slovenia. So one of the ones that's for tourists is Postoina. And as you can see, where they have one of those kind of silly trains going through the, uh, the caves. This gives you an idea with uh, illumination what it looks like inside. And there's a very interesting salamander-like creature. Uh, they call it the human fish. That's the translation of the Slovenian. And it only needs to eat once every eight years. So it's able to live without light in this. It's a blind thing, isn't it? Blind, I believe. Um, I think it's blind, yep. yeah. Um, but it only needs to eat once every eight years, and I actually saw one when we were in there. So that's not our picture, that's from a postcard, but it's uh, there are some remarkable. There are things like that found in the former Yugoslavia at a couple spots. On occasion, they'll come out on the surface, and it, sometimes these have been uh, observed in um, the big uh, marsh south of Ljubljana, and um, they think that observing these things uh, is where Ljubljana got tied to the idea that there are dragons around there. There's, oh yes, obviously a very young dragon. So moving to Ljubljana, which is the capital that everyone would visit, uh, some of the highlights for us were the Ljubljanica, the river that runs right through the center, where there's this square um, in, the, in the name of Presheren, their sort of famous poet. A lovely outdoor market and very nice architecture by Plechnik. And uh, the City Museum and the National Gallery are very interesting museums to visit. You can see the oldest prehistoric flute that's been found and the oldest wooden wheel, both about 5,000 years old, that have been recovered from the marsh from um, previous uh, peoples that lived there. People also like to go to the Park Tivoli and to the many, many um, festivals and parades and things that they have. So one to Pust, which is another word for Mardi Gras. Um, and their Advent celebration is a lot of fun down in the main square where they have devils and angels. Um, and you can, what was it we bought? You could buy devil candy and angel candy well, or the, something? So the, the, the seasonal cookies are things like Christmas trees and wreaths and Santa Claus and a devil-like thing with his tongue hanging out. That was a new one. And then one time when we were near the Presheren Square, they were, they were putting on Swan Lake. So if, if you're there any time of year, there's something going on in the main town and it's, it's a lot of fun. So um, you want to say anything about Jason and the Argonauts? Oh, um, so not so much in Ljubljana, I guess, although they, they did visit the marsh south of the city. Jason and the Argonauts partly takes place there and there's apparently a, there's a part where they're uh, they're at the map the mouth of hell where you can descend down into it and that's one of the the more dramatic caves um, in the Karst region uh, in Slovenia and uh, there are a couple of counties which have uh, Greek ships on their coat of arms on their shields and Ilska uh, Bistrica uh, where Yablans is located is one of those they found uh, um, Greek um, Greek Creek uh, ships uh, within the within that particular county. Um, it was a, a major hub uh, in the area for Rome. Um, as I said, called Imona. You can walk along the the Roman Wall at the edge of town. That's what was about twelve feet high. 
um, I'm not supposed to climb on it, but people do. Um, they were uh, excavating someplace just outside of it to build, uh, to build a, a bunch of new buildings and discovered they were in the cemetery. The Roman cemetery and everything had to be put on hold for a couple of years as they uh, as they looked at things and figured out where they could actually put something without destroying things and so on. Um, so that's uh, so a lot of Roman things uh, scattered around. Uh, there's a big castle up on the hill. You can climb up the hill or take a funicular up to it. And then there are um, a couple of uh, little museums up there and you can also walk walk all around. Um, Barbara already mentioned Napoleon and... And the wire route we'll come back to in a minute. So this is, I mentioned the Lyubanitsa that runs right through the town in the downtown area. You can see that lovely little river that has some very nice walking bridges. And you see the pink building there, that's one of the Plechnik um, pieces of architecture. And uh, kind of fun to have in your main square, uh, you know, your, your famous poet um, that was Prasherin. In fact, they even have a holiday, the Prasherin Odan. So they have a holiday for their main poet. I think that's quite an advanced thinking. Uh, you can see the castle on the hill up here that you can walk to. And here, here he is in the square with his muse above him and the dragons. So, it's, so there are, uh, I think, 20 dragons on this one bridge and four main ones which is kind of fun to take pictures of. There was a major earthquake about 135 years ago that wiped out a lot of the older buildings and it got rebuilt in the, then in the late 1880s and early 19, 1890s. And so it has a very Austrian feel from that kind of uh, late empire period. So this is also something of interest. Um, Every early May, they have remembrance and they walk the, around the wire. And that's the wire was the um, barbed wire fence that was put up by the fascists in, in World War II to prevent um, goods going out of Ljubljana to the partisans and into Ljubljana from the partisans. And so every, every year they walk that in remembrance of that war. But there's also some fun things. So one year we just happened to be there in the rain at, uh, at Mardi Gras time and we got to see this phenomenally crazy parade with the Coronenti. That's these guys here with big sheep bells on them and strange faces and big fluffy costumes and some bears and some hags. And there were also a bunch of people dressed as mafia, which I didn't find quite as funny. And lots of sheep, people dressed as sheep and dragging their sh um, their cheese along in a cart. It was quite quite an, a, a scenic day. So going a little further up uh, from uh, Ljubljana, people always uh, show um, Lake Blet when they talk about Slovenia because it's probably unusual to have an island in the middle of a lake that has a church on it. Um, and so that's one of the sort of famous scenes of, of Slovenia from the tourist guides. And above the hill, um, there's another castle. And Monastery. And, and they like to um, eat something called kremšnita, which is kind of like a milfoy, um, very fancy dessert. Um, anyway, we, we enjoyed going there. I mean, it's very beautiful and that's fine. But when we asked about going on the boat out to the island, it was going to be 25 euros for the two of us. And it was going to be like a 10 minute boat ride. And we <laughs> were just a bit cheap and we thought that was too much. So we didn't bother. But, you know, some people might like that sort of thing and have the money. So a little bit further north, uh, you're getting into the Julian Alps and the Triglau National Park, which is their famous national park and really lovely, lovely scenery. And there's another view. We stayed at a b and I don't know if this is ours. I can't remember. Might be. It might be. Um, and great views of Triglau from there. And right, right near the Lake Bohin. Um, right now we've come up um, the... Um, top of the Fogel, which is a mountain hill where they're skiing in the winter and have a great view down on the lake and over to the Alps. And there's also a very nice walk you can do up to Sava Falls. Um, there's another view back of the lake 
a very nice achievable thing that you can do in a couple of hours. And here you can see as we're walking up to the falls, um, the karst on the hillside. Surprisingly, there was also um, a cemetery there uh, as we we're walking by the falls to uh, fallen soldiers from the First and Second War um, with lots of different nationalities represented, Russians, Hungarians, Germans, Slovenians, Italians, and that was... The, uh, the, the front during World War I that people don't talk about very much is sometimes called the Italian front. Uh, it's it's the it's called the Sava Front in um, in Slovenia, and it uh, ran just east of there, and um, it, it was pretty much like uh, like the Western Front, where in in France, where the armies were opposed to each other and didn't move much for about two years, but just had tons and tons of weaponry and stuff. Um, there's uh, there was so much. Uh, hand grenades used there, which apparently contain a bit of mercury, that you still can't eat the fish from uh, from the Adriatic down at the bottom of the mountains where the Sava flows in. Where's my other oh, um, so now we're moving a little bit further east to another place, another university town where we spent a lot of time in, um, Joe had more projects there. I was more just a visitor. And uh, that was actually called the European Cultural Capital in 2012. It was a tiny place, but it, it is quite charming in the, in the core. Um, and what's great are the views up one side, you see the mountain where they do the skiing and hiking and ski jumping on the other side, which we don't have a picture of. It's just covered in vineyards with little churches mm -hmm. dotting along. It's a very scenic town. Um, the reason we have the picture of the snow there is that <laughs> it's just so odd to see snow on the end of the tree, but no snow on the ground. And that's because they had the snowmaking machine here. So there was a, a snow track for people who were like really hardy skiers who like to go down no matter what the weather. But you could actually just walk along on the grass. Um, and so that was kind of an amusing moment. And as I said, there is a lot of vineyards in Maribor, and there is a thing called the Stara Terta, which is, uh, means grapevine, and that's the oldest um, bearing grapevine in, in Europe, I think, or maybe the world. I think it's the oldest in the world. It's about 400-year-old grapevine. is still bearing fruit and still making wine from it. And you want to talk about this one? Yeah. Because the, the, nobody knew about this, this old grapevine. Um, they uh, they were renovating the area, which is down by the um, the Drava River, and um, they they were looking at old pictures to see what it looked like in the 1600s. And they said, "Wait a minute, there's a, a a vine at exactly the same point." And then they did investigations and discovered that hey, it's the oldest grape vine in the world. Um, up on the the mountain to the south of the city, um, the university has a little branch or a little research station and the point is to uh, to train people in traditional foods um, and drinks of Slovenia. Um, when we were there it was during the winter so they they had basically just bread and sausage and uh, and apple juice. Best apple juice we've ever had um, but uh, during the year, they'll serve whatever local, whatever thing is in season, and the students who work there get trained as, you know, so they could be chefs and stuff, and uh, and and make um, the traditional foods. And so, I thought a, a kind of cool concept, um, but it also is uh, quite good, quite nice. Oh, um, if you uh, go south east from. Um, um, from modern border, you come to the city of Ptui, and uh, it's one of the Roman cities. Uh, so the Romans called it uh, Poitoium, and you can see that uh, they still they're still calling it by the by their pronunciation of the reduced pronunciation of the Latin name. Um, it has a castle up on the hillside uh, where you can see the entire city laid out in the rivers and so on and so forth. And the castle is basically just a museum today. Um, 
they kept saying, have you been to the weapons room yet? Have you been to the weapons room yet? Which is at all these medieval weapons and so on and so forth. So we went just to please them. Uh, but my favorite room was the one that talked about uh, folk customs and they had all these uh, pictures, uh, all these um, uh, curenti and stuff and many other things uh, there. And for the bicycle, I just thought it was interesting that it was a bicycle made of wood, so I took a picture of it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we were talking a little bit here and there about food and how much they do enjoy food and, and encourage you to eat. It's the, the hardest thing to be in the family there. And then maybe some of you who have European uh, ancestors or family or you know may have the same experience um so that the three cousins of joe which are older than him but they live in three houses next to each other sort of three a one three b three c or something four houses. oh sorry four and and the deal is we'd have to have like you know 11 o'clock food feeding and then have lunch at the next house and then have afternoon feeding and then have dinner at the next house and we could barely walk after a day with the relatives but you know they're so generous and, and the food was so hearty and lovely so anyway we th thought it might be fun if you're interested in the food at all and um, these are a couple of the things the potitsa and the gibanitsa um, if you're ever interested um, the slovenians here in vancouver actually have a pretty good society and have um, events throughout the year with folk dancing and music and and the food and then the next time we're going to be seen is at greek fest and one of the other interesting connections to ubc is uh, one of the current costumes um, from the from the poos from the mardi gras was donated to moa um, and we had an event there uh, where you can see the the dancers and the musicians um, and uh, that was donated. So you can go to the MOA and take a look around, see if you can find the current costume, um, which is kind of a nice yeah. connection to UBC. It was a little bit of an odd event in some ways because we were there as dancers uh, for the ethnic group, not as UBC people particularly, but, <laughs> but wound up interacting with um, um, some UBC types. Um, I think the president's wife was there. President's wife interacting as professors with her as well. So it was a bit odd. And then just not something that I'm gonna go through in detail, but if you get the downloaded version that, that Paul sends out later, um, you'll be able to make your own pizza. We haven't learned to make that gluten-free yet. It's still a goal, but it's, it's yeah, worth, worth the effort. So, <laughs> That's all we have to say today, and we welcome any questions. I don't think we need so, to share thank you very much. I'll ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody. Uh, uh, put that on view gallery. So, very interesting presentation. So, Joe, you were originally from born in Slovenia, or you were born somewhere? No, my dad was born there. I see. Okay. So I was I was born in the U.S. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I moved here. My dad never spoke Slovenian to me because that's what happens in immigrant situations. Uh, but when I moved here, we did, we discovered there was a Slovenian community. So I've learned it since, and Barbara's learned as well. And uh, and we wound up vi visiting a lot. And so for ethnic reasons, we wound up doing a whole bunch of. Um, work with people in Ljubljana on language acquisition and uh, University of Marburg as well. So are there any questions or comments? Can't see everybody. But... Has anybody else been to Slovenia? Like in the group? No? We were we were to uh, my wife and I were to Slovenia as part of a trip through the Balkans, went to Slovenia, and Croatia, Oops. and uh, um, and uh, you know through that area. We're on a, we're on a, a, a bus trip for seniors. It was really quite good because the maximum number was twenty five, so we had really good uh, experience in each of the towns we visited because it'd be a local guide who would come and, and give us the 
the scoop. So we were in Ljubljana and Zagreb and uh, and Dubrovnik mm -hmm. and, and, and places around there. Loved it. Went and I just beach. had a I had a one day um, experience. I was on a cycling trip from Vienna to Venice, and we went sort of through Austria and came into Slovenia um, by Kranska Gora, and then cycled through the Triglav Park. And it was just stunning. I mean, absolutely beautiful. Um, certainly hilly. Um, luckily, we didn't have an excessive amount of traffic. And maybe because we were in the national park, people were driving, you know, slowly. Um, but it was it was stunningly beautiful, just amazing. Triglau is the highest mountain, and uh, yeah, a very very big park, um, and yeah, absolutely beautiful. If I could say something, um, I'm Ingrid Parra, and uh, this is my first time, so I'm really pleased to uh, listen to this presentation. My father was born near Rogashka Slatina in Slovenia. Um, and I grew up not speaking Slovenian either. I, I spoke German uh, because my parents both spoke German. But I want to ask you, have you ever heard of a German enclave in Slovenia uh, that existed since 600 years, but disbanded after the Second World War? Um, they spoke a, a dialect of German within Slovenia, and it's called Gotche. I don't know if you have heard that name before. Um, I don't. I don't know that specifically, but I mean, the whole country basically was a part of Austria. Um, it was conquered by uh, Charlemagne back in the 800s, and then ruled by Germans uh, in until the end of World War One, and so um, everyone, you know. Uh, German was the official language. Everyone would learn that as well. Um, speak Slovene at the home, but German at, at work in the cities and, and so on. So it wasn't at all unusual to have a, a whole lot of German speaking people. And um, and there were just there were waves of settlers that were brought in from Germany so that you get names, you know, go to the cemeteries and look. And in addition to the Slavic looking names like Jaksetic, which is my grandmother's maiden name, you'll find names like Stemberger and Schneider and Schuster and things of that sort. So it's it's not at all uncommon for that. But yes, German has become less, uh, except right around the Austrian border, much less uh, noticeable since then, except all the loan words. And it really depends on the generation. So when we're living in the homes with the family, um, as I said, the young people are all speaking English these days, but the older family usually are speaking German. And so, um, and, and there's a lot of German mixed into the Slovenian. So there's like, we, we would have learned Slovenian and learned sort of the Slovenian word, but they're still using the German word. So there's a lot of mixing of language and, um, but that worked for me because I spoke German. So that was actually easy, but yeah. Yeah, that interesting. So whereabouts did you say that location was? I'm trying to find out more detail, but it's called Gotche, which is the name of the, the region. Okay. Um, and after the Second World War, uh, the, the partisans uh, uh, invaded and, and, and obliterated it because they did not like anybody speaking German. So uh, all the people immigrated. So there are many in the United States and many in Canada. Uh, from that area, so I will, um, I will, I am looking into more of that. Uh, where you know, because it's six hundred years old, uh, the yeah. community. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, Slovenia is it's fascinating. It, it's such a small place, and it's so diverse. And and, uh, mm -hmm. right. and depend, as I said, if you're at one end, you can speak a Slovenian and the Hungarian with a Hungarian accent and words and. The other end, you're speaking a Slovenian with Italian accent, mm -hmm. and so you may not understand each other, and it makes it challenging for the you know the foreigner who's trying to learn the standard language that's spoken in Ljubljana, and uh, and you're you're they're all saying, oh, you speak such book Slovenian. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay, well at least you don't understand me. I don't understand you, and and uh, yeah, it's it's Joe Joe does a lot better with the dialect because he he heard it when he was young as well, but yes. 
is challenging. Yeah. I just ask you a, a question about the dialects, which you mentioned a couple of times and, and the difficulties people might have at other ends of the country from understanding each other. Uh, what, what's the influence of TV on that? Is there a national TV network which uses a single dialect or and, and kind of what's happening in that respect? Well, I mean, yeah, there's a it's 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 based in Ljubljana. Um, they they use the standard language, um, and then um, but when they go into some part of it, some 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 particular region in the country, and and interview people, or when there's some film which is made in the different areas, um, people get exposed. And my relatives are are from the the extreme southwest, and in the extreme northwest, um, they. They tell me, oh yeah, when they're interviewing somebody on the news, I can't understand them. Hmm. Um, so um, people people wind up having to learn the standard language in school. So all the younger people kind of like will will speak like the standard language, except when they're back home. Uh, but the the people who are in their their eighties and nineties um, just just grew up. Um, um, speaking their their dialect and tend not to to accommodate in that way, and it's taken me a little while for the uh, in the southeastern area uh, southwestern area to get to get used to things like that. I mean, it's sort of the word for mountain is gora, and my relatives say gora, and you know that, that's different enough that as they as they rattle off and you know speak quickly that so, that sometimes I won't won't. And every time I visit, it's like, oh, is that what that word is? As I kind of figure out that it's the local pronunciation and and so on. Um, but yeah, so the difference between the different dialect regions are probably, I don't know, dialects hold on forever for a very long time. But but people are are, are by dialectal these days. Yeah. Thank you. So, Joe, hi. Um, could you tell us a bit more about these costume figures in uh, Mardi Gras? Is it anything to do with folk rituals or dance, or is it purely costumes? Uh, well, I mean, the so the Kurenti, um, they're not really involved with the dance. Folk rituals, yeah, I mean, I I, I think so. I mean, well, the way they, the way they work it now is that um, the the Kurent will come in and come to a group of people who are having a party on um, um, on that day and uh, they, there's there's an element of misrule to it so that they're meant mm -hmm. to be a little bit on the scary side and kind of like come in and kind of bang around and uh, um, and I think there's an element of, of asking for either money or things to eat and so on as well um, but uh, so I mean, I suppose that's a that's a ritual. But there's there are elements like that of like someone coming in and in a in a costume and um, um, and and being kind of rowdy. Sounds like Newfoundland. Uh, it sounds like Newfoundland. Um, it was a common part of um, of things around Christmas and around um, Mardi Gras in most of Europe, um, and. And this, so it's probably probably goes back quite a long ways to the Middle Ages, at least. Um, and so, there's similar things in other countries. So there are even similar kind of creatures. We were watching a movie from, was it Bulgaria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had something that, that your, your first thought is, that's the strangest current I've ever seen. But it's sort of like you recognized it as being related. Yeah, thank you. I cannot see everyone, so if you want to ask a question or comment, just start talking. Okay. Well, since there are no other questions or comments, um, I'd like to thank uh, um, Barbara and Joe for a very interesting talk. And I'd like to thank all of you who've joined us for being here today. <clears throat>
this is the last session that we're going to have before we break for the summer. And then we'll start back in September. I believe we have uh, people organized for September, October, and November. Then we will take a break again in December. And we will look for speakers uh, for 2024. We're coming that far from now. So uh, I think we have one speaker already, I think, uh, um, for January of 2024. So we'll go on from there. So thank you all for attending, and I'll end the meeting. And thanks again to Barbara and Joe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for joining us on this. Thank you. Today, where the weather is so gorgeous out, you know? Uh -huh. That's how it is. Thank you very much. It was really enjoyed that. Anyone ever wants to go?